go steeper as we would expect before a major recovery, um, along with the expectations that there's going to be um, uh, upward pressure on wages and prices um, to go along with accelerating growth and the expectations of inflation. And therefore, investors expect that interest rates will rise and uh, investors will demand uh, more return for, um, the, uh, um, for the money that they lend into the markets. If we look here though, what does this tell us about the yield on the 10 year? A lot of uh, news is being made about the yield on the 10 year. The yield on the 10 year, in fact, closed on Friday at 164. It's, um, uh, it's gotten a little bit um, weaker uh, down to 162, so two basis points. What's going on? We know that uh, last week the European Central Bank made clear its intention to continue to push back against higher rates. We know the US is doing that. Um, so we've actually talked about that last week. Someone pointed out to me that the ECB had made a statement last week that we didn't address, but uh, still um, we've been talking about central bank pushing, push, central banks pushing back against higher rates. Um, what does this map here tell you that looks at the 10 year over a much longer period of time since the early 1960s? What is the trend in the direction of the 10 year bond? Negative. The trend in the direction of the 10 year bond is to fall, right? So long term interest rates have been falling for years. That's the point. Okay. Long term interest rates have been falling for years as a, as a result of a variety of things, not the least of which is growing efficiencies in markets around the world. Um, before we move to the next slide, let me ask you a question. If you look here in the, in the 1980s and in the 1990s, we had very high rates. So you're looking at rates of let's say 12, 13% in the mid to the early to mid eighties. And then in the late nineties, the late eighties, early nineties, you're looking at rates at seven, half, eight, nine percent If you could borrow money for close to zero in Japan at the same time, if interest rates were close to zero and you could invest that money in the US in US treasury markets at six, seven, eight, nine percent what, what function financial uh, activity will you have carried out? Money market hedge. You've carried out, okay, money market hedge. No, Arbitrage. yes, well, you've carried out, who said that? Andrew. You've said that you've car carried out interest rate arbitrage. That's exactly right. Both of you are right. Interest rate, but very specifically, interest rate arbitrage. You borrowed what an does that mean? The name of this is, is, the name of the trade is called the yen carry forward trade. You borrowed in yen, you carried your proceeds over into the dollar market. And because the spread on, the spread on interest rates were so great, the, the uh, uh, foreign exchange risk was uh, made much smaller as a result of that spread. And there was a great deal of, of uh, uh, money to be made. But anyway, that's a yen carry forward trade. We're gonna talk about arbitrage, currency arbitrage later. I just wanted to uh, make, make a note about that. Um, if you look here at the yield curves, this shows us the yield curves between over the course of the last couple of years. So you see March, of 2019 all the way up here. Then we have March of 2020, a year ago, and where we are now. So relative to where we were a year ago, what's happening? The yield curve is getting much steeper as um, um, uncertainty um, uh, um, begins to fade away in terms of, um, as you mentioned just before, um, the ongoing government uh, fiscal monetary support for the economic recovery, expectations for a strong recovery, lots of consumer spending. And so we expect to see a real steepening of the curve. Nevertheless, relative to where we were two years ago, where is the curve? The curve is much lower. So relatively speaking, interest rates are still reasonably low. Um, and so even if we see 100 basis points increase in, the, um, in, the, in the, the yield curve across the board, we're still basically where we were just a couple of years ago. Um, now, if we look here, are there any questions here on the yield curve? Okay. Now, if we look here at economic data that came in at the end of the week out of the US, we see a couple of things. Well, we see that jobless claims are still very high at 712,000. Continuing jobless claims are still very high at over 4 million. We see that job openings are at 6.9 million. That means there are a lot of jobs to be filled. The thing is, uh, there, are, there are more unemployed as we see 9.97 million than there are job openings available. So what does that mean? There's a bit of a disconnect. There's a disconnect in the labor market. 
which confirms why the Fed has taken the position it has, which it requires extraordinary continued support to support labor market conditions, which continue to be um, uh, uh, weak to just okay. Um, if we look further, we look at the producer price index that came out last week, it showed a 0.5% increase following a 1.3% increase in the month before. If we look at the charts below, you see producer prices since the trough or the, you know, the deepest um, uh, fall in prices as the um, COVID crisis took hold in the global economy, particularly here in the domestic economy, you saw that producer prices collapsed here, much like you saw during the Great Recession. And you see the corresponding inflation rate. This 121.3 to the 121.9 is the 0.5%. The inflation rate you see when corresponding inflation rate went from 0.1% to 1.7%. So what does this tell you? What's the trend that we're seeing here? Producer prices are increasing. Inflation is increasing. Is this a natural byproduct of a healthy and recovering economy, increasing, increasing inflation and upper prices, upper pressure on prices? Well, generally, yes, in the past was 2.5, like in like January 2020. So it looks right. like a recovery. But over the time, over, over the long term, we've talked about that the, we've talked about since the beginning of this, early on in the semester, the Fed's target rate of 2% on inflation. Now the Fed has, made, Fed has made clear they're not going to raise rates ahead of a 2% number, um, that they're more than happy to live with a 2% inflation rate for a while. Um, the overall point being that um, inflation is a natural byproduct of a healthy economy. The downside of that is too much inflation. So what's the balancing act now is that the Fed can't raise rates too early and they can't raise rates too, too, too late. It's called the Goldilocks effect. Um, it's it's got to be just right. Okay. And so that's what prognosticators and market makers are looking at very carefully. But the real takeaway is that inflation is going to happen. The question is when and how, by, and how much. And whether the Fed's, whether the FEPs, whether the steps the Federal Reserve is taking here and the European Central Bank abroad, as well as the, um, uh, the Central Bank of Japan, um, as well as other major central banks around the world, um, to uh, um, uh, address what's been a prolonged downturn in the global markets. Um, the last note that we had here was the, um, the last economic data point we got last week was the Consumer Sentiment Index, which is at 83. Let's take a look at a broader picture of this. So the top we see consumer sentiment and consumer confidence. Why is consumer confidence and sentiment so important? Because consumer spending represents better than 70% of the US economy, which at 21 plus trillion dollars um, represents um, uh, the largest, if not the, you know, am among the top two largest economies in the world. <clears throat> Pardon me. And so what consumers are thinking about the state of the economy and the state of the job market, labor market is very important to investors around the world to sort of gauge their mood about the market, about market strength. And so in the top um, of slide here, we see um, consumer sentiment, which as I point out here, the only real difference between the two, the two um, uh, measures is how the data is collected. One is collected uh, as a survey of 500 homes um, that tracks views on the strength of the economy um, that's what we saw on Friday's number. That's 83, which, as I point out here, is the highest reading since March of 2020. And then there's 10-year consumer confidence, which is uh, done by the confidence board. The first one, consumer sentiment, is done by the University of Michigan. And the confidence board does a survey of 5,000 homes tracking views on the job market, um, job security, and, and the labor markets. Um, What I wanted to point out to you here is that if you look in the beginning of the year in January of 2020, you see that in both the consumer confidence and consumer sentiment, we were near 20 year highs with, as I point out here, layoffs on employment at 50 year lows of three and a half to 3.6% with incomes rising and more jobs than there were unemployed, right? Now we're seeing the reverse of that, of course. And so we've seen uh, naturally um, a real reduction in overall consumer confidence and overall consumer sentiment. That's to be expected. Um, any other takeaways on these charts? 
Well, consumer sentiment seems to be recovering more quickly than consumer confidence. Anyone got a thought about as to why? Okay, I think it's because the general sense in the economy and the markets is stronger than it is among uh, in, in the job markets themselves, which still remain um, weak or tepid. Um, any questions here? Okay, then let's turn to our review. <clears throat> we more, more or less drew a thread in our illustration or drew a period as we concluded our review of the evolution of um, modern trade theory, beginning with the mercantilist all the way through um, uh, Lantif's paradox and Stefan Linder's um, uh, theory of overlapping demands, which refines Hector, H Hector Olin's factor endowment theory, which only refined Keynes's theory, which refined um, the theories before it, um, reaching all the way back to mercantilism. Um, so this is a less detailed review than we saw last week, but I think they go hand in hand and provide an effective um, uh, 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 review uh, uh, document for you. Are there any questions on this? Do I put this, for, put this out here? No? Okay. Ahead of your exam next week, this will be a helpful way to sort of organize your thoughts. Um, and here, of course, is a review of major topics that we talked about last week, beginning with internal versus external economies of scale, inter and intra-industry trade, the product life cycle. And then we introduce the idea of government policies that both protect the environment and protect workplace safety. Um, and then the idea of transportation costs that, well, that tra what is the impact on transport of transportation costs and overall trade volume? What reduces overall trade volume is it adds another layer of costs. Um, it's good for um, import competing businesses that would like to disregard, would like to discourage imports. Um, in order to protect their jobs that are increasingly being outsourced to markets around the world. Um, and we're talking about, in this case, the US market. We're gonna really focus, the bulk of our time now is on tariffs and industrial policy. If I draw your attention to the last bit here, reminding you of where we were last week when we talked about the different types of government, the different types of tools available to the government to try to stimulate comparative advantage to um, support a particular sector of the economy. Um, uh, and we talked about things like tax incentives, subsidies for research and development, loan guarantees and low rate loans, all used to revitalize basic industries and enable dynamic comparative advantage. Um, in terms of the comments I made here, just in terms of the United States and think about what's been done here, the US, I mean, it, as recently as the US under the Trump administration under warp speed, uh, diverting, you know, you know, lots of money to the uh, implement uh, the development of the vaccines. Um, there's no doubt that the Trump administration deserves some credit for that, and credit should be given where credit is due. Uh, much like the U.S. government, which has put lots of R&D money over the poor, past four or five decades into things like information technology, which is one of the reasons why we have the internet, broadband, biomedical, agriculture, and of course, in the healthcare industry. Excuse me. As we try to broaden our discussion on tariffs, we talked about uh, Japan after World War II and say that Japan after World War II had a natural comparative advantage in labor intensive production, um, not in um, the production of electronics, which is where they decided to put their efforts to, the, um, to, the, to support steel, the auto electronics industries after World War II, as opposed to labor, which would have been more natural, labor intensive industry like textiles, which would have put them in direct competition with, with China in East Asia. The idea that Japan decided to go another way and create a competitive advantage, much like India has created its own com competitive advantage with, with, its, with its knowledge workforce that only continues to add more and more expertise to its, um, uh, its resume as the years go by, um, uh, where we're able to outsource increasingly white collar oriented jobs to, from accounting to architecture, to engineering, um, to venture capital, so on and so forth. Um, where, as we said last week, um, uh, um, uh, that the internet becomes a substitute for immigration itself because the communication is 
um, made possible, much like it is here um, through Zoom, uh, that wasn't possible, let's say, uh, five or 10 years ago, so that someone that's working as an engineer um, in India can uh, be working full time for an American based company or European based company without ever having to leave um, Mumbai. Um, so, again, the technology becomes a substitute for immigration. Are there any questions on this brief review? No. Okay. So, in terms of new material, we're again, we, well, this is what we just talked about. We talked about industrial policy in Japan during after World War II. So, we talked about tariffs, which is the key. Uh, the key tool that we're going to spend the next three sessions on class about. And tonight, I'd like to talk about the different types of tariffs. I'd like to talk about effective tariff rates and different conditions of tariffs. Um, and then I'd like to talk about bonded warehouses versus foreign trade zones, which allow companies to avoid tariffs and duties. And then finally, we'd like to talk about the welfare effects, which one of you very correctly raised last week but the welfare effects that are occurred um, in the process of imposing tariffs. Uh, so here, what do we say? That a tariff is um, a duty that's imposed when goods cross a national border. The customs duty is, of course, the most common tariff instrument. So what does the chart demonstrate? That there's the, there's the, tension, uh, that there's the tension between um, uh, policymakers and the public. In other words, policymakers are pursuing greater global efficiency um, and uh, uh, um, uh, what does the public want? Well, some of the public wants more protection. Some of the public doesn't want more protection. But the tension is between offering more protection or offering um, less protections with fewer tariffs and non-tariff barriers. The folks that want overwhelmingly for protections to be in place are import competing businesses. So textile manufacturers that fear uh, low cost imports coming in. And uh, um, okay. So free trade theory says that open markets lead to the most efficient use of global resources. Anything that restrains free trade is considered to be negative. Anything that restrains free trade is considered to be uh, uh, something that causes a negative welfare effect that reduces the benefits of trade, right? Um, uh, obviously, import uh, competing businesses are going to uh, consistently uh, resist um, uh, uh, anything any type of trade doesn't include protection for domestic industries um, that are facing um, uh, low cost uh, competition from abroad, which of course makes sense. The challenge for policymakers is do what? Just like with the Fed, not too much, not too little. It's got to be exactly right, because if it's too much, what do you get with too many tariffs, too high tariffs? What happens? No trade. You get a trade, you get a trade war. You, you get a trade war. You get a retaliatory tariff trade war. Why does the UF have such low tariffs? Because we have trade agreements with so many countries around the world. Our tariff rates are something like one or 2%, as opposed to other countries that rely enormously on tariffs for what? To graze, to, 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 earn, to, to earn money. Um, but let's not get off the subject now. Um, uh, so let's talk about the different types of tariffs. So obviously a protective tariff is a tariff that's gonna, you know, that your objective is here to reduce imports and to insulate your domestic um, your domestic producers, your domestic import competing producers. So revenue tariff is going to generate revenues on imports and exports. Now, the tariffs can vary depending upon the time of the year. If you expect that um, imports into the U.S., for example, agricultural imports are going to increase at one part of the year as opposed to the other, then um, it, it, tariffs can be increased or decreased depending upon the seasonality of, the, of whatever the agricultural product happens to be. Um, so we talk about a specific tariff. A specific tariff is just a fixed dollar amount, which is very easy to, excuse me, which is very easy to administer and to apply. The problem is, is that the degree of protection varies inversely. The degree of protection varies inversely with um, the change in import prices. How is that so? In other words, if it's a fixed price, if it's a $100 tariff on the car and the car is $15,000, but then the car is $50,000 has the same tariff, well, that's, a, that, that, that's not a very useful tariff. It's a useful tariff for low price products, right? So what does it do? It encourages domestic producers to produce cheap goods, less expensive goods, where the degree of protection is high. 
Okay, it protects low cost producers against foreign competitors who may cut their prices during recessions. Okay. Professor. Well, sure. Could you please um, provide me an example with uh, revenue tariffs? I'm sure revenue tariffs on, um, uh, um, I'm trying to think of bananas, fresh bananas or fresh oranges that may come in from South America or other agricultural products, depending upon the season, um, American producers of those same products are gonna demand uh, tariff rates that are exceptionally high when those products are in season and domestic producers from South America are looking to ship in uh, their, their ship or export their products into the United States. The US is notorious for erecting very high tariff barriers when it comes to agricultural products from South America, which does what? It protects domestic producers, but what else does it do? It makes it very hard for foreign producers to sell their agricultural products into the world's, well, for the moment, most important domestic, the world's most important consumer market um, and um, only makes poor countries poor. We're not gonna get into that detail tonight, but uh, that's my example, apples and or oranges. Yeah, bananas, sure. So it's more focused into agriculture products. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. It's not just agricultural products. It could be, it could be um, uh, low price shoes. It could be low price furniture. It could be low price anything. But oftentimes we see, in other words, it's encouraging producers to stick with products that are low cost because the specific tariff is gonna become less effective, the more expensive the good. Okay, thank you. Okay. As I point out here, you're welcome. It's often applied to standardized commodities, things like grains, precious metals. Excuse me, things like grains, precious metals, electricity, oil, beef, OJ, natural gas, and staple products like bread, milk, sugar, paper, okay? Now we talk about an ad valorem tariff. An ad valorem tariff is something that is a fixed percentage of the, good of the goods value. And the question is, is how is that value determined, right? The good thing about an ad valorem tariff is that it ma maintains a constant degree of protection for domestic producers throughout the business cycle. So it's good, as I point out here, for manufactured products with grade variations. So instead of saying on every Toyota car coming into the US, there's a hundred dollar specific or fixed tariff. Well, that doesn't do much good if you've got three or four or five uh, Toyota models that range from 15,000 to 60,000. Isn't that right? So this protects against that because the degree of protection increases with the price, okay? Now the question is, is how is the value determined? Well, there are two techniques, the US techniques. Well, as I point out here, there are two, there's a custom valuation process that's expensive to administer. Nevertheless, this is what we do. There's the US which uses the free on board valuation, which means the tariff is applied to the product's value as it leaves the exporting country. That's the US free on board valuation. The next is the cost insurance freight valuation that is used in Europe. And what that means is that the tariff is levied as a percentage of the value of the good. And that includes the um, transportation costs, logistics costs, the insurance and freight costs, okay? It's the value of the good when it arrives at its financial final destination. So it includes the value when it departs its home country plus the cost of shipping. Any questions on this? Okay, very easy, straightforward, some definitions. So the key is this ad valorem and the specific tariff. The next tariff that we're gonna look at is the compound tariff, which is a bit more complicated and it's applied to manufactured goods. And it has two components. It has the ad valorem portion. It has the, excuse me, it has the specific portion plus the ad valorem portion. So if you think of woven fabrics, you've got raw cotton and you've also got the completed product, the finished good, the woven fabric. So the compound tariff that's applied to woven fabrics does two things. It 
neutralizes the cost disadvantage for domestic producers who use cotton that's protected by the United States tariff system. So it neutralizes the cost disadvantage to domestic producers resulting from the tariff protection granted to the domestic supplies of raw materials. And then it protects the manufacturers of the woven fabrics with an ad valorem portion, right? So you've got the fixed portion that protects against the protects for the protection granted to domestic producers of raw materials like cotton. And then you have the ad valorem portion, which is a percentage of the value that protects domestic manufacturers of woven fabrics. So they're being protected, protected twice, both at the production stage with their raw materials and at the finished stage with their finished good. Does everybody understand that? It contains two components, ad valorem and specific. Okay. Okay, so if we look at compound duty is applied to woven fabrics now in the US is 48 cents plus 38 percent. So the 48 and a half cents compensates the domestic producers for the more expensive cotton that they've been forced to buy, domestic cotton, and it compensates them for the uh, 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 against the competition. Uh, uh, from low cost foreign producers, right? The Adam Laura provides protection for the bone fabrics against low cost, uh, um, low cost producers. So you have your fixed portion here and you have your ad valorem portion, okay? So if you look here, what do we see? If you look at taxes on international trade as percent of government revenues, so here's the US, which is not on here. Oh, here it is, the US at 1.3%, like I said. So the US maintains a generalized system of preferences program because we have so many uh, trade agreements with nations around the world. If you look at other smaller nations here from uh, Bahamas to Bangladesh to Russia, for example, you see very high tariff rates. These are poor countries that use tariffs as a way to raise revenue. Excuse me, <clears throat> pardon me. So now we should talk about the nominal tariff rate. If there are any questions we're going through, please don't hesitate to stop me. So there's nominal tariff rate and there's an effective tariff rate. The nominal tariff rate is the rate published in the tariff schedule. It applies to the value of the finished product into the country. The effective tariff rate takes into consideration any tariffs on any of the inputs that went into the product. So it takes into the nominal tariff rate of the finished product plus any tariff rate applied to the imported inputs in production. So this is the formula that we're going to use for determining the effective tariff rate, which equals the nominal tariff rate less the ratio of the imported input to the value of the finished product multiplied by the nominal tariff rate on the imported input divided by one minus the ratio again of the value of the imported input to the value of the finished product. This is a formula that you'll need to know and it will certainly be something you'll be tested on. So we talk about two different types of tariff rates, the nominal tariff rate and the effective tariff rate. So let's look at an example. So we see here that we've got Sony, which is producing component parts and with component parts and assembly, its import price is gonna be $500. You've got Dell, a domestic a US, a domestic US manufacturer that has the same, uh, faces the same cost conditions from, from ported component parts and assembly activity. The difference being that Dell's component parts are imported as opposed to Sony's. So what do we know? We know that Dell's component parts represent 80% of the value, right? They represent 80% of the value. The 400 of the 500 is 80% of the value. 20% is the domestic assembly, 80% are your imported components. So with free trade, we tell you that Sony can produce and sell PCs at $500 a unit, but they have to hold their assembly costs at $100. Why? Because if not, they wouldn't be able to compete against Dell. So 
now we have a situation where a 10% tariff was imposed because Dell is a, a, a company that successfully lobbied for tariffs to be tariff protection to be put in place against competing Sony PCs. So a 10% tariff was imposed that brings their overall cost to 550. So they have a tariff adjusted import price. What does it allow Dell to do? Have a better price, get more profit. They can have a better price. What else can they do? Or export. Or export, that's good, two things, lower price, uh, export, or what else in the domestic market? They can lower their own prices. They can just produce more. They can add, they can produce more. They can increase their domestic production and still meet Sony's price is what they can do. Do you see that? Yeah? Could you go? They can still meet Sony's price. Pardon me? Could you go one Let's more time? Mm -hmm. Sure. Here we are. You've got the cost structure, cost conditions for Sony and Dell, right? Sony to remain competitive with Dell can't increase its costs more and Dell is going to remain competitive with Sony. It keeps its costs exactly at what Sony says. And it, it lobbies for a tariff. It gets a tariff composed of 10%. That means so that the tariff so adjusted prices. So what we are saying is that knowing that uh, Dell is producing more, it's using more most um, of its products domestically, they can increase their units too much. Um, it just, exactly, it just means they can increase their production. They wanna keep their costs level with Sony. So mm -hmm. here they are, then a tariff was imposed. Now Dell can increase their costs by, and that allows them to increase their, increase their production. That 10% tariff, the comment that they could uh, 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 you know, outsell them in terms of a lower price, absolutely. They don't need to increase their production, but they can increase their domestic production because that gives them a cost advantage. The, mm -hmm. the, the tariff gives them a cost advantage. They could export, they could sell at the lower price, either domestically or abroad. But of course, you'd have to consider logistics costs, transportation costs on the foreign price. But domestically, they could sell lower price. But for our purposes here, what we're saying is that they're expanding their production. Okay, so yeah. we say that if the when the when the tariff on the finished product is greater than the tariff on the imported good, then the overall effective tariff rate is greater than the nominal tariff rate. That's very important. Let's say that let's say that again. When the nominal tariff rate is greater than the tariff on the imported input, the overall effective rate is greater than the nominal tariff rate. And of course, the opposite, is, the opposite is true. But let's look at this example first. So I've indicated again the formula for determining the effective tariff rate. We know that the, the domestic components is 10%. Uh, the value of the imported inputs is 80% of the whole. There's no tariff rate here. And we see that the overall effective tariff rate is 50%. If there was a 5% tariff on the imported inputs, as you see here, we see 0.05 takes the place of the zero tariff rate. We show that the effective tariff rate falls to 30%. At the same time, if the tariff on the imported input is greater than the nominal tariff rate, what do you think? Well, then the effective tariff rate is going to be less than the nominal tariff. In which case, what we say is that the government is not interested in the finished goods industry. So look here. If the tariff is 15% on imported inputs, then the effective tariff rate is only 4.4%, right? So the government is more interested in protecting domestic suppliers of raw materials than domestic manufacturers of woven fabrics, the finished goods industry, right? We know that raw materials and inputs, basic inputs, are typically admitted duty-free or at a very low rate versus finished goods. So you see an escalation of tariffs from, let's say, lumber as opposed to assembled furniture or to veneers or finished, finished wood floors. Excuse me, pardon me. Are there any questions here about the, how we determine the effective tariff rate? That's important. You'll definitely be tested on that.
So okay, could we good. say that? So professor, could we say that um, the agricultural products um, it would it would be one of the it would be cla classified as the effective uh, tariff rate because it's less uh, the percentage. Well, the, well, go ahead. Yes. The percentage is less. I mean, it's more. It's fifteen percent tariffs. Right. So that, in other words, here the the, the, there's an imbalance. There's a tariff rate on the imported input that's greater than the tariff on the product itself, mm -hmm. right? So if you need to import, let's say a motor, you're, you're, you're gonna assemble a lawnmower and the motor has a tariff of 10%, right? Um, and the tariff on the motor is 10%, but the tariff on the completed lawnmower is 0%. There's a disconnect there, right? So it's the same thing here. What do we see? We see that if the if the, the, the tariff rate on the imported input is greater than the nominal tariff rate on the finished product, much like in my lawnmower example, well, then, of course, the effective tariff rate is going to be lower than the nominal tariff rate, which defeats the purpose of imposing the nominal tariff rate on the finished good. What it does is it shows a bias to the raw materials industry. Okay, folks? Okay, then I'm gonna go on here. So we said here, right, that raw materials are often imported at zero low interest rates. So again, the nominal or effective protection increases at each stage of production and protection. As I give the example, with, uh, lumber logs that are being imported for free while processed woods face much higher import tariffs. So if you look here, we show tariff escalations in advanced and developing nations. And you see from Bangladesh through Brazil, the US and globally, how you see the difference between agricultural products, both primary and processed is dramatic, as is the tariff escalations on industrial products that are um, uh, primary versus processed. You see a very, you, you, see, you, you see a significant difference. Any questions here on this data? No? Okay. So what's good about this is encouraging to developing nations, encourages developing nations to develop their commodity-based operations, but what doesn't it do? It doesn't, it discourage, well, it discourages them from growing, um, from growing their um, growing their manufacturing sector from diversifying into higher value added exports. Yes, it helps keep poor countries poor. Okay. So if you look here at softwood lumber prices, this is Canadian softwood lumber prices per 1000 linear board feet, which is a standard way that Canadian softwood or that softwood lumber is priced. You see what it was in 2015. In 2016, it went up 14%. In 2017, we're at 54%. And then you begin to see dramatic increases as a result of the trade war that was initiated by President Trump. And what, of course, this well led to was higher construction prices and, and home, home construction and home prices because of because of all the downstream effects of higher priced lumber. Canadian lumber is a a tremendous resource for U.S. home builders, um, and one of our biggest sources of lumber um, from around the world. And so, of course, it's had a direct impact on, on, on home prices. Um, so we talk about the offshore assembly provision in 1930 that happened at the same time as the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act that provided favorable treatment to products that were assembled abroad from U.S.-made components. It's the U.S.-made component, the value of that component is not included in the dutiable value of the good. So if you have a car and the engine is, it's a, it's, a, it's a German car, but with a US engine, the value of the engine won't be included in the dutiable value of uh, the car itself. So this is an incentive for US made components. It generates sales and jobs in domestic component industries. So, we talk about legal and illegal tariff evasion. So legal tar tariff evasion means that you are utilizing 
the tariff system to the firm's best advantage. So a good example is a Ford, which strips imported passenger car vans to avoid higher tariffs. Um, back in the 1960s under, I think it was President Johnson. And since then you have 25% tariffs on imports of foreign made trucks and cargo vans and a two and a half percent tariff on passenger vans, even if produced by a US company abroad at lower cost. So what does Ford do? Ford imports five passenger wagons. And what do they do then? They import the wagons at the lower tariff rate and they strip them and they reconfigure them and turn them into two passenger cargo vans. That's the way they avoid the 25% tariff. So they convert five passenger wagons into two seat commercial wagons, two, two seat commercial cargo vans, rear windows are replaced, <coughs> pardon me, replaced with and replaced with metal, the rear seats and seat belts are removed, new floorboards are installed, and there you go, and you avoided that 25% tariff. Any questions on that? So this tariff evasion, uh, uh, and here under tariff evasion, you're evading tariffs under, uh, you're, you're evading tariffs using illegal means by smuggling goods into a ported country. We talk about imported steel tariffs. Um, we, we talk about a smuggled imported steel, which has been a concern in the steel industry for years. As I point out here, about half of the steel that's imported into the US is um, uh, subject to tariff. There are about a thousand different types of steel coming from over a hundred different countries. So it's actually very complex and, and difficult to control the amount of smuggling that takes place tariff evasion that takes place in the steel market. As I point out here, it's difficult for the customs service to monitor all the shipments because of limited staff. And sometimes importers falsely reclassify the steel as duty free. Um, and uh, consistently the customs and the CPB, Customs and Border Protection has been overwhelmed and underfunded. Um, the hope is that under the Biden administration that's going to change but it's one of the reasons why we've seen um, the steel markets um, exploited for years. Now, if we look here, getting back to our example of the lawnmower. So a lawnmower that has a, the, if the, the, if the motor itself has a 5% tariff coming into the United States, but the lawnmower, the completed lawnmower has only a, 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 um, a 0% tariff rate. So what, what's the best strategy? The best strategy is, would it be great if I could import the, 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 the motor and assemble my lawnmower in a place where I'm not subject to the duties and then not release my finished lawnmower into the US market until the demand is there for it. And so what has evolved in the, what has evolved over the course of the last century is a system that involves bonded warehouses and foreign trade zones here in the United States. And uh, in both of these places, importers can leave goods and they can do a variety of things within those particular zones, we call them, until they are released into the, released into the market. They can delay the duties or the taxes that they have to pay until, as I said, the products or goods are released into the market. So in a bonded warehouse, products can be less duty-free up to five years and the duties are paid when the products are removed. This is an example of a bonded warehouse. And you see all the goods here sitting on pallets. So goods in a bonded warehouse can be stored, repacked, or further processed, but critically not assembled into final products, nor can any manufacturing take place. Domestic, domestically produced goods cannot enter a bonded warehouse. So in terms of flexibility, it's much less flexible than a foreign trade zone where a lot more can go on. At the same time though, it's a great place for someone to import a finished good that doesn't require much work and let it sit in the warehouse until the demand is available, the demand is there, or until the importer, for whatever reason, 
wants to release that into the market, all the while delaying the taxes that need to be paid um, for the imported goods. A professor, okay? how, yeah. do you, how do you regulate a bonded warehouse? Um, well, in terms of import, in terms of imports, in terms of payments, in terms of, um, I mean, of like, uh, country I guess... origin, there's enormous, enormous regulation in terms of how products go into a bonded warehouse or a foreign trade zone. Sure, enormous regulation, the paperwork that has to be provided, layer upon layer upon layer, and then of course there's the fees, which we're going to get to in the minute. Um, but if you look here, it says the warehouses have to be authorized by the US Customs Service and the owners have to be bonded. So the bonding company is guaranteeing the payment of the customs duty if the importer is unable, much like a bank guarantees the payment of the importer with a letter of credit. So in terms of fees, getting back to Andrew's point, we looked at the pallets before. I'm not gonna test you on that, but just because I'm not gonna test you doesn't mean that it's not worthwhile the information to have, certainly in light of the discussion. So just to spend 10 seconds on storage fees, the way that they work is they're based on the based on the pallets, which go from six to fifteen dollars per pallet per month. There's a standard pallet size. The most standard way, um, in, in along with uh, pallet um, uh, costing, is uh, costing by cubic footage, cubic storage by cubic foot, and it's called a long-term storage fee. And I've given you the fees ranging here. Square footage storage is far less common contingent on rates in specific markets and are not usually used with non-standardized products, okay? But you can't just ship anything that came in from a country, any, you know, some country without all the proper documentation from all the various U.S. agencies that have to sign off on imports that come into the country, whether it's a simple thing like a, like a pair of eyeglasses or a simple or a very, you know, complicated thing like a, like an automobile. Um, so we talk about foreign trade zones, they're much more sophisticated and they allow for a much broader range of activity, okay? They're overseen by the US Customs and Border Protection. Um, they're organized around seaports, airports, and national frontiers, and of course, inland distribution points. There are about 230 or more, maybe 240 foreign trade zones by now in the US and about 400 sub foreign trade zones in the US. So here's very important. Companies can operate without paying duties on the imported goods as long as they remain within the foreign trade zone. And the duties are paid when the goods are transferred. And as I said, the FTZ allows for a much broader range of activities compared to the bonded warehouse. Of course, the bonded warehouse. So if you're bringing finished goods that aren't ready for market, it's, it's phenomenal because you can delay your, your duties until they, they need to come out. However, if you're looking back at our example with regard to the lawnmower that has a case of um, a higher tariff for the imported input than it does for the finished good, then of course, um, a, a foreign trade zone is the way that you want to go because what can you do? You can repackage, you can repair, you can assemble, you can manufacture, you can destroy, you can do just about anything in a foreign trade zone. So you can help eliminate duties on product waste or scrap. So imagine that you're, you're a company that imports chemical components and you import two chemical components that have duties on them as individual chemical components that you're gonna put together and to create some type of, you're gonna take X and Y chemical components, you're gonna, you're gonna create X, Y chemical. And it doesn't matter what the chemicals are. The point is, is that you can do the um, manufacturing process of putting the chemicals together within the foreign trade zone and then the tariff on the finished product is less than the tariff on the individual chemical components. And during the heating process that puts together the chemicals, you lose 20% of the overall volume of the chemicals. And so you're paying a low, at the end, you've got a finished good and you're paying a, a lower tariff on 80% of the volume of what you imported at a higher tariff rate all within a foreign trade zone. If anybody doesn't understand that, Please let me know. Okay, so that's the example. Of, yeah. Doesn't it, does it require a lot of space? Does it require a lot of space? These spaces are huge. They're huge. They're huge territory. It's a huge zone. 
it covers multiple, you know, it's, they're enormous. And yes, it covers, requires an enormous amount of space, which is why they're huge. Got it. So they also neutralize the inverted tariffs that we've been talking about. The example I'm giving you of the, um, the lawnmower, that's a case of inverted tariffs. When the duty rate on the overall finished good, and the example we used was the lawnmower, is less than the duty rate of the component part. And the example I gave was 5% on the motor, right? So by manufacturing the finished goods in the foreign trade zone, domestic firms or US-based firms that could be foreign firms that are operating in the United States, they take advantage of the inverted tariff duty rate while keeping manufacturing operations in the United States, which is good for domestic labor. What the program does is it corrects an imbalance favoring foreign production. Okay, so we talk about Toyota. Toyota has vehicle processing centers located throughout the country within these foreign trade zones. And what do they have within those processing centers? Millions of parts for all the millions of automobiles, Toyotas that are all over the country that require parts now and again. But until the parts leave the foreign trade zone, Toyota hasn't paid the duty on the parts, okay? Now, in terms of fees, again, something I'm not going to test you on, but uh, for the point of uh, knowledge, I think it's worthwhile to talk about it, certainly relative to the, um, the fees, the pallet storage, and the cubic foot costing that we looked at with um, uh, the bonded warehouses here. Um, the foreign trade zone fees are a little bit different. You have a merchandising fee for every customs entry. There's a minimum fee of $25, a maximum fee of $485. The maximum merchandise processing fee applies to entries with a value greater than 239.52. It may seem like an arbitrary number. It seems like an arbitrary number to me, but according to Customs and Border Protection, that's the number. So I use the example of an importer who receives 10 shipments per week, each with a value greater than that number. That means they're paying $4,850 a week or $252,200 per year for those, uh, sh to store those shipments within a foreign trade zone. Um, any questions on foreign trade zones? Okay, good, very good, good. So let's turn on, yeah. It's regulated by the US government. It's regulated by US Customs and Border Protection. Right, it's the, the department, I would, it's going to be the Department of um, Department of Commerce, Department of Commerce. It's going to be the Commerce Department. Yes. Yes. It, no, it is the Commerce Department. No, 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 it is the Commerce Department. Speaking of um, uh, departments, um, uh, um, the U.S. just first named, the, the U.S. just named its first Native American to re lead the Interior Department, Deb Halland. And that's a, that's a, that's a great moment. Deborah Hallen, who's an American Native Indian, Native American Indian, and that's a, that's a reason to cheer. But I don't want to get off the tariff work that we're doing. So let's move forward. Yes, the Commerce Department regulates um, uh, foreign trade zones and bonded warehouses. So let's see if we can get through some welfare effects and then do a little bit of hedging if we have time in our remaining twenty some odd minutes. So we talk about consumer surplus and producer surplus that's created. And we say that the consumer surplus is the difference between what the buyers are willing to pay and the actual amount they're paid. There's an inverse relationship between the price change and consumer surplus. It's the area under the demand curve and above the price. So it's graphically represented by the area under the demand curve and above the price. Now, producer surplus is the area above the supply curve and below the price. And it's the revenue that producers receive above their variable costs. And here, there's a direct relationship between the price change and consumer sur and producer surplus, as opposed to the indirect relationship that we see with consumer surplus. The higher the price, the lower the consumer surplus, and the higher the producer surplus. Again, it's the area represented by uh, the area above the supply curve and below the market price. Oops, sorry. So here we are together. You have the produce consumer surplus and the producer surplus. Are there any questions on that?
Pardon me. So, come back. Okay, so moving along, let's talk about welfare effects in a small nation. As someone pointed out last week with regard to something that we were talking about, the idea of a price taker nation, a price taker nation is a nation that faces a constant world price level, right? And it is too small to influence the world price, right? Either market supply or market demand, they can't influence market prices, and so they become a price taker. So the tariff on the imported product shifts entirely to the domestic consumer via higher prices. So we say that the consumer surplus falls and the terms of trade remain unchanged as a result of the tariff. When a small nation imposes a tariff, this is how the, uh, this is how, this is how uh, the welfare effects are distributed. So the welfare decreases by amount of the protection effect and the consumption effect. The protection is effect is a result of ineffective or inefficient production and the consumption effect is a result of what? Lower consumption is a result of higher prices. So these are your deadweight losses that are due to a tariff. What does this result in? Higher domestic production because we're, if we impose tariffs, we're gonna encourage inefficient domestic production it increases the producer surplus, it lowers domestic consumption because of higher prices, and it decreases overall consumer surplus because now we're paying more for the goods. So what's the conclusion? That tariffs limit or restrict imports to protect domestic producers at the expense of domestic consumers. The question is what? The question is by how much, right? That's the big question. As you saw with the lumber prices, well, as a result of the trade war, um, uh, that began in 2018, we saw that uh, lumber prices soared. Um, but overall, the U.S. maintains relatively low tariff schedules um, with regard to incoming uh, goods um, into the United States. So let's take a look here at a small nation facing with tariffs. So where are we at Otarki? At Otarki, the nation is selling 50 cars, selling and producing 50 cars at $9,500 a unit. Yes? So here's your consumer surplus, the area above the price, below the demand curve. And here's your producer surplus, above the supply curve and below the price. So here, once trade begins, the nation faces an elastic, a perfectly elastic supply curve right? This is the supply of the domestic supply plus the world supply at $8,000 a unit, $8,000 per car. So what does that happen? What does that mean to consumer surplus? It means that consumer surplus is going to dramatically increase. But first, what's going to happen to, to overall domestic production? We were producing 50 cars at $9,500 a unit. Well, if we can buy them at $8,000 a unit, domestic production is sure to fall, in which it's in and in fact, it does to 20 units. Overall consumption, though, is going to increase to 80 units, as we see here, which means that imports are going to go from zero to 60 units. So consumers are better off, but domestic production falls. We have our new consumer surplus that went from E, F, and G to include A, B, C, and D, and the domestic industry is damaged by foreign con competition with lower revenue and fewer jobs. Any questions here? Okay. But look at that. Look what happened to consumer surplus. It got dramatically bigger. So consumers are happy. Domestic producers are not happy. And what do they demand? They demand tariffs. They get their tariffs. So a tariff of $1,000 a car is imposed. And the supply curve, which now is the domestic supply, the world supply, plus the tariff goes from $8,000 a unit to $9,000 a unit, which means a loss of consumer surplus of A, B, C, and D. Yes, as the supply curve shifts up by the tariff amount. The consumer surplus falls by this amount here, A, B, C, D, and now it's back to, it's at E, F, and G, right? Before we were just at G, yes, okay. So let's go through the various welfare effects. 
there's the redistribution effect, which is the transfer of consumer surplus to producer surplus, right? And all I did was I took the area of a square and a triangle that gives me $30,000, that's A. Now we talk about the protective effect, which shows the uh, uh, domestic production replacing more efficient foreign production. And it's a loss of domestic economy from inefficient production used to produce increasing unit costs. The area of the triangle is uh, uh, $10,000. Then we talk about the revenue effect. The revenue effect is the government's collection of the duty, which is just the area of the, the square, which is $20,000. And finally, there's the consumption effect, which overall production went from 20 to 40, overall consumption falls from 80 to 60, and the cost of that um, loss of consumption is $10,000. Now your dead weight welfare losses equals the uh, B plus D, your protective effect and your consumption effect, excuse me, your protective effect and your consumption again for $20,000. If we look at it all together, what do we see? We see your redistributive effect, your protective revenue consumption and dead weight losses. Yes, are there any questions here, thoughts, comments, observations? Oh, Professor, uh, the supply is perfectly elastic because supply is fixed, is that why? It's a small nation that can't affect world price and they're a price taker. And so whatever the price is of the world, they're gonna take that price. The world was, the, their price, their domestic price was 9,500. The world price is 8,000. They impose a tariff um, that raises the price to $9,000, it's going to be totally absorbed by the, um, uh, by the consumers um, because the domestic, because the foreign producers are not willing to absorb any part of the tariff because it's a small nation unable to influence the, unable to influence the global price. If it's a big nation, what do you think happens if the U.S. imposes a tariff on Toyota cars of $1,000 a unit? What does Toyota say? Toyota says, well, you know, we're not going to eat the whole thing, but we'll accept some of it. We may pass on $500 and we'll eat the rest. You understand? Because why would they do that? Because they want to protect their market share. But in the case of a small nation, they're price takers. They have no control, no influence over market price. They're going to take whatever the price is. Does that answer your question? Okay, good. So let's move on then. We have a good few minutes left, good 10 minutes or so. I'd like to do couple of, I like to do a hedging problem, okay? So everybody get out your calculators. Let's take a look to make our way through this problem. So we see that the U.S. multinational has an accounts payable of 1 million pounds in one year. I'm giving you the spot rate. I'm giving you the forward rate. That means that the dollar is expected to strengthen the course of the year while the pound weakens. I'm giving you the strike on the call, the call. Now we know that any spot price higher than the strike with the call option means that the investor is doing what? The investors are covering their premium payment. So any spot price over the strike price is an in the money call option. So here we have a call option with a strike of 132 with a premium of four cents a unit. We show our expected spot rates here with probabilities assigned. We see the borrow rate and the investment rate in the UK and the borrow rate and investment rate in the United States. So the question is going to be, let's, let's work through the various options. So to do the forward hedge, we have, excuse me, to do, to do the forward hedge, what's going on? Sorry, to do the forward hedge, um, what are we saying? The forward rate is $1.36, that means it's going to, it's going to, that means what? It means our payable is going to cost us a million three sixty. If we do a money market hedge, we're going to invest against our payable in the domestic market, in the local market. Excuse me, in the local market. So we've got to discount our million uh, million pound payable by what rate? What rate do we have to discount our payable by? We're going to invest an amount of money in the local market so that it grows the amount of money we owe. So what rate do we have to discount the million by? Deposit uh, of UK. We have dollars, yes. right? The deposit rate. You have, to do, do, do okay. you have to discount it by the deposit rate. Who said that? Alec, thank you very much. So you discount it, which means the value of that is 950, 119 pounds today. 
What is the US dollar value of that? It's a million two fifty four one fifty seven. If I borrow that amount in the US at six and a half percent, that means it's going to cost me a million three thirty five six seventy seven. So in other words, I'm going to borrow the million two fifty four one fifty seven at six and a half percent. I'm going to invest that in. I'm going to convert that to pounds and invest it in the pound market at five and a quarter percent for a year. That's going to get me my million pounds. And it's going to cost me a million three thirty five, which is about twenty five thousand dollars less than the Ford hedge. Now let's take a look at the call options. So I have the right to buy at a dollar thirty two. Well, a dollar twenty eight. Am I going to buy the? Am I going to exercise the call? No. No. no I'm not going to exercise the call. What's the amount paid? I'm paying a. I'm paying a dollar twenty eight plus four. Which is a dollar thirty-two. I'm paying a million three twenty. At a dollar thirty-four, will I exercise? Yes, I will. Yes. I'm paying a total of a dollar thirty-six because I have to include the premium. That gives me a million three sixty. And finally, at a dollar thirty-nine, the outcome is exactly the same. Now we're going to run through our probability distribution, which gives us our expected cost of a million three forty-six. Now we're going to look at our unhedged probability. So for unhedged, that means we're going to we, we've got to cover our payable in a year at whatever the spot market is. So at a dollar twenty-eight, a dollar thirty-four, a dollar thirty-nine, we know the probabilities. We run through the distribution analysis. They give us a million three thirty-nine. Now we put the four of them together. What do we get? A forward hedge, money market hedge, call option hedge. Unhedged, which is the way to go? Money market. Money market. Fantastic. You guys are great. We got five minutes. Let's look at the next problem. A company has a three month accounts payable, Mexican peso, 325K. The one year Mexican in Mexico interest rate is 2.98%. The Mexican spot rate is 4.8 cents, 0.048. Using a money market hedge, what is the firm's initial U.S. dollar deposit? I'm expecting someone to, I'd like you to calculate that right now. You've got a discount. What do you got to do? You got to discount your accounts payable by what? 2.98% divided by four, whatever that number is. divided by four. Why 2.98 divided by four? Because it's a three month payable and that's the one year rate. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So once you do that, that's 1.075. That gets you 322.581. And you've got to deposit that into a Mexican bank earning 0.75% for three months. You took the 2.98, you took a quarter of that, gives you 0.75%, right? So what's the answer? The answer is the 322,581 at 528. That's wrong. Obviously, everybody knows that's wrong. It should be the spot rate, right? It should be the spot rate. It was the spot rate, and I changed the question. Excuse me. It should be 15,000. Oh, it is right. 322, 581.048 is 15,044. It's right. It's just this number, the 0.0528 is what's wrong. I'll correct that when I post it tonight. Sorry, that was my flub, this, my flub when I put the screen up. Sorry about that. Let's look at the next problem though, before we break. New York City is now saying that 80% fewer tourists came in 2020 versus 2019, as we're not surprised because of COVID. When 60 million visited, tourism decline is projected to cost local businesses 4.65 billion in sales. What's the negative spending shock effect of lost sales given an average marginal propensity to consume of 89%? Well, if you have an average marginal propensity to consume of 0.89, you just have to figure out what? What is your expenditure multiplier, right? So it's one over one minus marginal propensity to consume gives you one over 0.11, gives you 9.09. Multiply 9.09 times your 
Initial change in spending gives you the expected total change in spending of 42, a little over 42, loss of 42 point, little, little over $42 billion lost spending in 2020 as a result of a fall off in tourism following uh, the COVID, as a result of the COVID crisis. Okay. I hear unsettling silence in the, in the, out there, folks. Yes, I'm, I'm okay with this one. <laughs> Let me tell you. Let, let me let me reiterate again. Uh, I'm gonna. You've got answers posted on on Blackboard. When I come into class on Wednesday, we're gonna. I'm gonna have a um, a good comprehensive overview of what I think the midterm what what the midterm will look like and things to help you um, studying. Um, but uh, Chapter Four, we're gonna finish on Thursday, and I'm gonna assign to you over the weekend Chapter Four problems. And then of course we have class on Monday. We'll have a chance to review. I'm gonna ask you to do some problems. That we're going to do in class together as we've done before some problems in class for mapping problems and uh, um, some review on Monday and then of course you'll have the exam on Wednesday um, but ahead of uh, Wednesday everybody please uh, have a listen tomorrow to see what the Fed's going to do over the course of the next couple of days tomorrow on Wednesday and uh, keep an eye on the markets send me any questions that you might have and uh, uh, make sure that you finish chapter four reading for Thursday's class and I wish you all a good, safe continuation of your night. Okay. Thank we you very class? much, everybody. You're saying Thursday's Thank class? You, you mean Wednesday? And then Monday and Wednesday's class. Pardon me. I, I'll get that right. <laughs>